Good morning. My name is Dima Yared. I am a human rights officer at the UN Human Rights Regional Office for Europe, based here in Brussels. We have with us today Olivier de Schutter, who is United Nations expert on extreme poverty and human rights. Uh, welcome, Olivier de Schutter. At the end of January, you completed a virtual visit to the EU institutions where you focused on economic and social policy of the European Union and the impact that that policy is having on people experiencing poverty in Europe. You had a range of rich and intense meetings with different actors. Uh, you met with people working in the EU institutions. You met with EU member states. You also met with cities, with social partners, as well as civil society organizations representing people experiencing poverty. So I have a few questions for you today on behalf of our audience, and I am grateful for your time and sharing your thoughts and observations with us. My first question to you, um, Mr. De Schutter, is why do you think this visit is so important at this moment in time? Well, following the COVID-19 pandemic, the EU has reacted with a series of instruments and initiatives that uh, will result in the EU questioning the approach it has taken until now in the fight against poverty. And essentially what the crisis has shown was the need to rethink certain macroeconomic constraints, certain tools of macroeconomic policy convergence that prove inadequate to build social resilience within the EU. And it is this debate that we now must have within the EU in order to ensure that the member states are better equipped to address poverty. And for this reason, this report, based on the visit I did with the EU institutions in, um, in December and January, um, shall be, I hope, influential in shaping those debates in the future of the EU. In your experience, what are the ingredients of success when it comes to tackling extreme poverty? There is a very classic approach to addressing poverty, and that approach consists in growing the economy, creating wealth, and then taxing corporations and high wealth individuals in order to finance public services and to finance social protection um, um, floors and, and policies. Uh, this is a very important part of what it takes to combat poverty, but it is not sufficient. And in fact, we need to broaden our imagination as to which tools can effectively combat poverty for three reasons. First, because that classic approach to combating poverty relies on economic growth as a precondition for poverty reduction. Yet we know that economic growth cannot be pursued indefinitely. It has major ecological impacts and it is increasingly um, unsustainable. Secondly, because this approach to tackling poverty will be increasingly challenged as it looks like um, a system in which you, you tax the, risk, the, the rich in order to uh, distribute to the poor and it will meet with um, increasing resistance in the future. Thirdly, and, and finally, um, it is uh, a policy that tends, that leads governments to uh, try to grow the economy uh, by means such as trade liberalization, such as the, 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 the deregulation of labor markets or the um, uh, alleviation of tax burdens on corporations in order to attract investments. And these policies create exclusion, create poverty, um, at the same time that anti-poverty policies try to compensate for that kind of exclusion. So we need to be much more imaginative and to address poverty as the result of market mechanisms we must rethink and thus think about poverty um, as uh, requiring us to reshape market mechanisms uh, before having to compensate for the exclusion that the market creates. And so we need to, to broaden the panoply of tools we use to combat poverty in order to, uh, to be successful in this policy. What is your assessment of the measures the EU is taking in the recovery response to COVID-19? In reaction to the crisis that resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic, the EU has uh, adopted a number of initiatives that are extremely remarkable. First of all, it has allowed the member states of the EU to support companies by removing the disciplines on state aid, and especially the wealthiest countries within the EU 
have been using this opportunity to support um, large corporations in order to avoid them falling bankrupt. Secondly, the EU has put between parentheses the Stability and Growth Pact that basically imposes on member states in normal times very strong constraints of a macroeconomic nature in order to ensure that they do not grow uh, uh, public debt and increase annual public deficits. And this is why um, the crisis also teaches us that there's another way to pursue um, development um, than to have this economic straitjacket imposed upon us. And thirdly, the EU has adopted a recovery plan, a set of instruments under the next generation EU package, including um, a new uh, financial facility, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, um, for a total amount of 750 billion euros, um, 672.5 billion of which are dedicated to this Recovery and Resilience Facility. So these are extremely important initiatives it remains to be seen, however, whether they will have a significant impact in reducing poverty and inequalities, or whether they shall simply allow the economy to return to, uh, to the normal uh, situation that existed before the crisis, in which poverty was still high, and in which inequalities were on average growing across the EU. We are seeing a rise in the number of working poor. According to recent figures, over 20 million people working in Europe are at risk of poverty. Why do you think that is the case? And what is the EU reaction? In order to combat unemployment, many EU member states have developed new forms of work in the form of mini jobs, uh, zero hour contracts, temporary contracts, part time employment. Um, and this has created a growing number of people who, although they are working, and sometimes working full time, are not able to make a decent living from their work. In total, we have 9% of the working population in the EU, which is at risk of poverty, 20 million people, and that is indeed unacceptable. We need to ensure that we do not only create employment, but that we create decent jobs that are paid at a minimum a living wage, and that um, we avoid creating these precarious forms of employment in which women and young workers are overrepresented and that are today the most at risk of losing their jobs um, uh, following the economic crisis that results from the pandemic. So I'm extremely um, troubled that today having an employment in Europe and even having a full-time job is not a guarantee that you will not be at risk of poverty. As you know, expectations are high for an upcoming action plan on the implementation of the European pillar of social rights. What do you think such an action plan can and should contribute? I believe the first commitment that should be made in an action plan to implement the European Pillar of social rights is a commitment to reduce poverty and to do so with the setting of quantitative targets that all countries should have to report um, uh, about. Um, in 2010, when the EU adopted its Europe 2020 strategy, it committed to reduce the number of people in poverty by 20 million by the year 2020. And of course, the EU failed. In fact, it failed by a very large margin. We need, however, to reset a target to guide countries uh, to this objective. I propose that by 2030, we commit that in the EU, the um, number of people at risk of poverty be reduced by 50% and that we work towards um, this objective. That means in Tiralia, adopting a new initiative to ensure that all people in Europe will have basic income security. Um, today we have very different approaches to providing this basic income security, this um, um, minimum income across Europe. And we expect from the Commission that it takes uh, an initiative, that it makes a proposal in this regard, I hope in the form of a framework directive, harmonizing the way this minimum income is set across the EU and ensuring that all countries um, uh, protect their citizens from, um, from income insecurity. Um, I believe this is achievable despite the huge differences between member states. It is possible to adopt a common methodology as to how the minimum income schemes should be 
um, set and and um, uh, and guaranteed, and that is the single most important initiative the EU could take in order to reduce the risk of poverty in the EU. So, what are the next steps now in terms of your report and how you will continue to work with the European Union on these important issues? Throughout my mission in the EU, I met with a large number of individuals and organizations very committed to combating poverty and reducing inequalities in the EU. And I very much hope that this cooperation will continue. There is a real momentum today in Europe on these issues. And the Portuguese presidency of the EU that started on 1st of January 2021 is deeply committed to making a difference in this regard and to relaunching social Europe. There shall be a, a major social summit convened in Porto in May uh, 2021. I do see this as a unique opportunity uh, to, um, uh, uh, for the EU to adopt a number of initiatives in this regard. Uh, Commissioner Nicola Schmidt, in charge of employment and social affairs in the EU, shall propose a child guarantee protecting children uh, across the EU from, from poverty by guaranteeing adequate nutrition, adequate education, um, adequate um, um, housing, as well as access to healthcare. And I believe that uh, that initiative, as well as the initiatives already adopted on the minimum wage across the EU and the one we hope to see adopted on adequate minimum income schemes, all these initiatives create a real momentum that now should be seized. I think the crisis has shown that we needed to focus our efforts on building social resilience in the EU, not simply on reducing the costs, not simply on maintaining um, macroeconomic orthodox approaches that reduce public deficits, but also in by investing in people. And in my view, that is the debate we now shall have. The Conference on the Future of Europe that shall be launched in May shall be a huge opportunity to, to get this message across again.